<laughs> uh, is the third in a series, a monthly series that we started here. We have a lot of programs here at the Historical Society. Please check out the calendar uh, that we have online or on your chair. Um, we have events here like once or twice a week, and we, we, we try to make them really interesting. Don Rumford here was chair of our programming and education committee for a long time. He recently quit. Um, so I'm a little upset about that. But you know, he has kids and a job and all that. And, uh, Don, actually, he helped to found uh, this museum. And as a former member of our, our board, he's uh, uh, really not been easy to replace. And so actually, if anybody's interested in uh, participating in our program and education com uh, committee, please uh, see me afterwards. We'd love to have you involved in planning forums like this one. So this uh, Fighting Back series uh, was inspired by the last election, really. Um, and uh, we were trying to think, well, you know, we have to play a part in this. Of course, we already are playing a part in it with all our other forums. But how can we be more specific in responding to the political climate that we we're facing um, and still fulfill our mission. And our mission is to collect, preserve, and present, interpret our history, but it's also to contextualize our history and make it meaningful for all the diverse aspects of our community. So, uh, so with this series, what we wanted to do was look at a contemporary social issue or movement and try to put it in a historical context to see you know, what, what role did this issue play for the queer community historically, the LGBTQ communities, and then uh, how does that history inform what we do today? Um, and how can we learn from the lessons of the past and apply them today? And so uh, the first forum a few months ago was on the 30th anniversary of ACT UP's founding in New York, and uh, the parallel organizations here at the time were Citizens for Medical Justice, AIDS Action Pledge. We had a wonderful, event with, it was sort of like an act up meeting, it was really kind of crazy. <laughs> and uh, uh, a lot of old act up dinosaurs like myself were, um, you know, saying, I was there and kids don't know what the hell you're doing and that kind of stuff. And so it was really kind of, uh, it was kind of amusing from um, that angle. Um, and the last month, what was the one we did last month? We did so many events. Anyway, um, uh, was so um, anyway, so tonight uh, what we're going to look oh last uh, uh, so tonight we're going to look at uh, electoral politics. So it was direct action, and tonight we're going to look at another aspect of political movement, um, which is not of course mutually exclusive from direct action and civil disobedience, but uh, I, in the way I look at it, it kind of works hand in hand with it. Um, so uh, Don Romsberg, he's uh, the chair of the Women and Gender Studies Department at Sonoma State University. Um, he's a gentleman and a scholar, and, uh, uh, and so I'm happy to have him here to facilitate tonight's forum. We're doing it in the round, um, and uh, Scotty from Archive Productions is gonna be videotaping um, for our archives, um, and I was kidding the panelists earlier to say that we should transcribe the, uh, the forum and then uh, cast actors to play them and put it up on the stage. And I think that would be an interesting way to interpret history. But uh, uh, so um, I'll just turn it over to Don from there. So Great. thank you very much. I hope everyone enjoys. Great. Yeah, thank you. The, the first one was actually on radical left or uh, solidarity movements in the 80s. Yeah. Anyway. Um, so yeah, so we thought this could kind of be a, a kitchen table conversation. Um, and um, we want you all to feel, of course, like you're a part of the conversation. Uh, we should never keep uh, our audiences from joining in the conversation, which I love about the Historical Society. So um, if you do have, I'll leave some space at the end uh, for a lot more sort of audience back and forth. But if you have something that you really want to sort of bring into the conversation as a question or as a, a comment or reflection at some point during the conversation, just raise your hand and I'll, I'll get to you, okay? Um, so we have um, a wonderful assemblage of folks here tonight. Um, Kim Alvarenga is, uh, was raised in San Francisco's Mission District. She's a queer woman of color who's been a member of the Harvey Milk Club since 2008. Um, has spent most of her professional life working um, with and on behalf of women of color and other, other underrepresented communities 
in their struggle for economic justice. Um, I'm not going to read everybody's long bio, is that okay? Okay. Um, you're almost as bad as academics in terms of the length of the bio you said, by the way. Um, uh, <laughs> Harry Britt, um, uh, uh, Harry Britt's first days in office were the result of the tragic assassination of his friend, Harvey Milk, and appointment by then president of the Board of Supervisors, Diane Feinstein. Um, Harry was one of several individuals that Harvey Milk requested in his last words to fill his position, uh, narrowly losing to Nancy Pelosi on her original run for the House of Representatives. Harry is one of the most op popular openly gay candidates of the time and remains the most senior openly queer politician living in San Francisco at 78 years old. Um, uh, let's see, I'll go around. So Sean Haynes is a native of San Francisco. Sean has lived and worked in each of the city's 11 districts. Uh, in 2017, Sean founded San Francisco Impact Partners, where he uh, re currently serves as the organization's executive director. Uh, Sean's goals are to affect the remediation of the disparities that impact communities that are most in need, impoverished, homeless, and communities of color. Um, Sean was elected in 2015 to the position of assembly district delegate representing District 19, ran for a seat on the San Francisco DCCC, uh, oh, sorry, De Democratic Central, I'm not trying to use too much jargon, right? <laughs> Central <laughs> County Committee, for those of you who don't know. Uh, a current associate member of the San Francisco Democratic Party. In October of 2016, Sean founded and became the first president of the San Francisco Black Community, of San Francisco Black Community Matters, Matters which is a Democratic club. Uh, Rebecca Prezan um, works at Google as Chief of Public Affairs, a senior liaison to local governments throughout California. A 10 plus year Castro resident who married her law school sweetheart, Julia, three times, each of the times that we collect them all. I know, yeah. Uh, as Mayor Willie Brown's LGBT liaison, she advocated diverse, for diversity on city boards including the first transgender person to serve, and also serve in the DA's office and managed Senator Kamala Harris's first campaign, and co-chair Devin Dufty's first supervisor of Zorial campaign. Uh, and then last but not least, um, I believe our youngest uh, person here on the panel, uh, is uh, Brad, is it Chapin or Chapin? We Chapin. Just, just met, okay, Chapin, I'm sorry. Uh, so on the um, Harvey Milk uh, Democratic Club's Executive Board, um, originally from Crater Lake, Carter Lake, uh, Iowa, yep. Brad's uh, activist life began in Omaha, Nebraska, just as gay marriage was legalized in Iowa. Um, uh, with the mentorship of Deb Dr. Deborah Hope and Dr. Brandon J. Weiss, Brandon worked to culturally integrate LGBT support groups, create online platforms for rural queer youth to make connections and to seek mental and health services. Uh, Brad went on to a clinical psychology PhD program in Boston, most recently working as a research assistant for UC the UCSF, uh, sorry, UCSF study uh, military acculturation and will begin graduate study, wow, well, that's a lot of degrees, uh, at UC Berkeley studying social welfare and policy um, this next fall. So welcome everybody. Let's uh, give our, our <laughs> And I really want us to uh, come on in and have a seat. If you're, if you're, feel free to come in. There's still seats over here, uh, some back over here. Um, so I really want this to be a way that we're sort of toggling between past and present, and really thinking about the way that, um, that the past uh, shapes the present. Uh, so uh, I'll ask a couple of questions that really kind of get at that. The first one is, uh, how do you think that San Francisco's LGBT political clubs uh, have shaped San Francisco politics? And um, we'll just start over there. Yeah. Um, well, I, I wanted to just start off just to say thank you to society for having us. Um, and just start off by saying that um, we have a lot of history in the room. Uh, we all stand on the shoulders of people and champions that have come before us, so I, I want to acknowledge Harry. Uh, because we, many of us sitting at this table are the legacy <coughs> of those that have come before us. That's why we're having a conversation and Tab and Sue for all the years' work. 
and Gito. Thank you for all the work in the Latino queer community. Um, and so I believe that uh, coming from the Harvey Milk perspective, being uh, chair, co-chair this year with a, another Latina immigrant uh, for the first time, um, I believe that a significant contribution is us. We, we reflect the work of the history that's gone before us. Um, Harvey Milk uh, fought long and hard for very many years to give voice to underrepresented communities. Uh, he worked in solidarity uh, with labor, with people of color, um, understanding that our struggle was connected at some level. And when you raise the ceiling for one community that's been underrepresented, you raise the ceiling for others. And by doing that, you become stronger in your political uh, goals. Um, and so it's in that spirit that I believe that uh, lifting the voice of underrepresented people to make sure that they have a, a seat at the table has been a significant contribution uh, for at least the progressive uh, wing of, of the LGBT movement, you know, the progressive voice. The LGBT uh, Harvey Milk Club was the first democratic club to include the word gay, mm -hmm. um, you know, as, as an active club. And I think that just for me sitting here at the table today, talking about the work to make sure that people have a voice at the table is a reflection of that work mm -hmm. and that can I respond just to that gay part? Uh, really, there probably would not be a Harvey Milk Club if Alice Mikotas had been willing to put the word gay in the name of their club. Mm -hmm. we, I'm not talking about Alice today, but Alice in the, in the early 70s, we had huge battles uh, because we wanted to identify as gay people. And there were motions to say, let's call it the gay, straight, and other democratic <laughs> all kinds of crazy manipulations to avoid dealing with the fact that the reason we were there was because we were queer. Mm -hmm. And that had, you know, we didn't go off from that into a lot of different directions. And we, but uh, that was in the, you know, in the formation of the Milk Club came out of that debate. And uh, it was, <coughs> I'm going to quit there, but, but uh, it, that fundamental acceptance of alienation as the starting point, not like well, gay people are just like everybody else, which was where Alice was back at that point in time. But the assumption is that, uh, you know, the world fundamentally misunderstands me. They deny the power of a whole set of people that could be transforming the culture, and those are our allies. And uh, Harvey Milk, that was Harvey Milk. And uh, it, it affected a lot of us very hard. Mm -hmm. But what's, interesting, what's also interesting about that question, having, um, I, I'd like to position myself as like the inter, inter, intermediate generation, somewhere in between you know, being active in the 70s and currently. Um, what the clubs have done. Yeah. Um, San Francisco is a mecca internationally for gay people to move here because we are more accepted here than we are in most other places. I feel very weird. Gay I know. It's, <laughs> it's, it's a little weird. Um, I'm but uh, the, the clubs are breeding grounds, right, to mm. see who wants, how people define themselves and where they see different issues. And some people get married out of them, some people make lifelong friends out of them. But the breeding, get, and maybe it's the wrong verb to use, but um, <laughs> you're, 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 finding, um, uh, you're finding the next supervisor. But it's not just the election. It's not the person who has their name on the door. It's the policymakers, the aides, the campaign workers, and all the people that are pushing different policies to see where people are at. And that has uh, completely changed the face of our town. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, I mean, one of the things I think that, that, that both clubs have really been effective at pushing for is not just uh, the, um, germination is also not a good word, but the <laughs> cultivation of um, electeds and candidates, right? Um, but also pushing for LGBT appointees, right? In all sorts of levels of government. So, um, I was, I was just kind of curious from your all perspective, um, what do you think the, um, this particular city's longstanding relationship with 
LGBT elected officials and appointees has done for this city? Um, like what, what are the ways in which um, our very visible um, uh, appointees and electeds, how has that transformed the shape of San Francisco politics? Well, I'm just going to jump in and yeah. talk about a couple of other clubs, yeah. uh, our LGBT club that San Francisco has had in its history. Um, outside of Alice and the Harvey Milk LGBT Democratic Club, we have had a number of other LGBT Democratic clubs that have sprung up. Um, there's the Byron Rustin LGBT Coalition, where I got my political start, um, sort of parallel um, and shortly after I went to Alice. Um, it's a, the only black LGBT political organization in the San Francisco Bay Area, mm -hmm. responding to the needs of um, that um, demographic here in the city and also in the East Bay. Um, the San Francisco Black Community Matters Democratic Club is, is a new charter democratic club, and our board is actually majority LGBT. Mm -hmm. LGBT gentlemen, and we hope to have some more women join our, our leadership soon to replace uh, some women who have left. But we also have had LGBT organizations that sprung up out of um, some of the challenges that San Francisco has held with respect to its diversity and its political leadership, and organizations like Baga sprung up and um, to sort of um, create a space that could be a little bit more safe and accepting for LGBT people who are people of color that wanted to express. Um, and, and to push them to leadership and to um, use that part of strength to move issues forward. Um, and then also later on to stand in parallel with some of the other groups who mm -hmm. um, could stand in parallel on, on those issues. So I just wanted to make sure that we mentioned those. Uh, yeah, I appreciate um, that. And in fact, Legata emerged out of, um, right, with uh, a feeling of marginalization and exclusion within the other LGBT Dem clubs at the time. Right? I mean, that was, there was a real rift in the, what was it, the early 90s, right, um, where, where that emerged. And, um, and I think having LGBT democratic clubs from, uh, uh, that are centered in communities of color um, has also led to um, a greater visibility for LGBT people of color in terms of political appointments and um, staff, staffing, right, um, seats at the table. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I feel pretty privileged, you know, having worked with Paul Mamiano for six mm -hmm. years and having been his district director, I, I had a first-hand experience, you know, looking, learning from him, um, you know, him having a historical perspective, uh, you know, being side-by-side -side with Harvey Milk, um, and the, the impact that he as a gay man had mm -hmm. on policy, not only here in San Francisco, Obviously, we don't work. It's, we don't do it by ourselves, right? We do it in coalition. But when we look at our city and the face of our city now, when we think about the rainy day fund that helps children, when we think of domestic partners, when we think of universal health care that we have here in San Francisco, that is actually, you know, at a national level, they looked at that, you know, thought about the way they wanted to do it on a national scale. At the state level, you know, when you look at um, the bullying bill that affects our community and kids that have been bullied, um, the transgender bill of rights, uh, the domestic worker bill of rights mm -hmm. that um, really forces like uh, for folks to give domestic worker labor protections. Mm -hmm. um, these policies not only have had an impact on San Francisco and the face of what we look like now, but we've actually been able to push, you know, not only at the state level but the national level. Mm -hmm. We couldn't have done it if we didn't have like champions, queer champions, um, that knew how to organize. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so what have been some of those, um, uh, what have been some of those other um, ways that what's happened here in San Francisco has gone to the state level or to the national level that are really memorable for you all? I suppose we can pick the biggest one, which is uh, um, LGBT marriage. Mm -hmm. um, I remember when we had Gavin Thompson decide to go ahead and do that, and I was just like, wow, okay, we're going to make that whole step here in San Francisco, and even though that got pushed back, um, it led us to where we are now, in terms of we, we have that, and we've got that for a lot of our states, and even though there's still some cleanup to do, um, we were able to really rally the support, and I think we're in an interesting time right now where we sort of have to repeat history mm -hmm. in terms of what happened with our presidential election and the type of administration that's in uh, power now and the, the type of repeals that they're going to want to do for all the laws that we just won and the laws that we, um, you know, 
we'll find ourselves fighting for in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, basic human rights, which I, one of the things that I have been studying for the last several years to figure out what can we do, um, not just as an LGBT community, but or LGBT leaders in the community, but just leaders in general to really bring back some of the focus to uh, extremely marginalized and economically impacted people um, in San Francisco and beyond. All of our major cities in this country are just really being hammered in yeah. terms of uh, outside of affordability issues, we really are starting to look like a third world country. Right. Um, and it's really apparent in, in San Francisco being one of the most richest places in the country. I mean, walking through District 6 is really scary. Mm -hmm. They don't have tents there. They are mm -hmm. living directly on the concrete. Mm -hmm. And I really, as a native of San Francisco, I can not express how we never really had that issue growing up mm -hmm. in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. You would see people who had um, fell on hard times, but you would not see it to this level mm -hmm. extreme where you can't walk more than a block before you see the next sad story. And I want to do so much to remediate those issues. Um, I think uh, the LGBT <coughs> really needs to um, grow to bring on that challenge to say, um, all the rights that we're fighting for it needs to come down to that bottom level and then work its way up. Yeah. And I'd also add um, uh, health care. Mm -hmm. um, if, if you need to see the story, you can watch Let Me Rise and have Roma's voice like right there as she did it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, today's news about Sanctuary City clearly mm -hmm. positions us as front and center. Um, I mean, there's there's just it could go on and on and on. Paid parental leave is another one. Mm. Just in terms of um, how we positioned ourselves as 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 the front lines mm -hmm. for um, many rights. Mm -hmm. You were gonna say something too? Yeah. Um, I, you know, the the reason I'm here and the reason um, I, you know that that I came to the city was because of things like I heard about racism, <coughs> for example. Um, and, and and just you know against the law, like allowing these gay marriages to happen. Mm -hmm. um, but that that like reminds me of sort of something um, that I think about a lot. And I, Harry's one of my biggest mentors. One of it's changed my life completely, um, and has helped me understand a lot of these things a lot better. But I think you know what Gavin did was live in a city. Where he's real, and no, no offense to this, but he's on the other side of where I stand, where I think the milk club stands on a lot of mm -hmm. sort of economic issues, mm -hmm. and he did something that I think was relatively politically advantageous, and where he is, um, but he at, at, a, at a more important time when gay men were dying of HIV and AIDS, and uh, we really needed protections, and you know, queer people of many, um, you know. Of, of all backgrounds, were really suffering, being kicked out of their apartments, um, whatnot, not being able to see people that they loved in the hospital. Harry wrote yeah. the first domestic partnership, <coughs> partnership legislation, and this is in a time where we were practically against marriage. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't, and while I love, you know, gay marriage was legalized in Iowa when I was 18, and it changed my idea and gave me so much hope for the future, but also later on, I kind of wish that I never wanted it. Um, mm. And so, I think, and, and I think it's just really important when I watch When We Rise, I don't see the history that I really want to see. I don't see the radical left as much. Mm -hmm. I see Rome and I love what Rome has done, but I don't see as much of the left and the accurate left. Mm -hmm. When I see the milk movie, I don't see as much of what really happens. Um, and uh, I think that politically, one of the things that's happened in the city is, um, one of the great things that's happened is that we do advocate for, for all sorts of people from all sorts of backgrounds, as long as they have enough money, often. Um, and so, I mean, I think that there's sort of a dilemma that we don't really know how to deal with that necessarily. I think when, when, when moderates are not um, having fingers pointed at us, that, at them as the bad guys and Trump is the bad guy now, I feel like defenses go down a little bit. And we sort of move forward a little bit more on some of the progressive mm -hmm. issues because I think it's really hard for people to respond to those things when they like feel some guilt about that. Mm -hmm. um, but I just don't want to forget that you know Harry wrote that domestic partnership legislation yeah. at a time. Where, um, you know, I, I think that really spread, and I think that that really had an amazing impact on the city becoming more queer yeah. and people being protected. And um, yeah, yeah.
Yeah, well, Harry, I actually wanted to kind of ask you directly. Um, so what do you think were some of those critical early building blocks that were set into place in the um, like late 70s through the, say, mid 80s that um, sort of created the possibility for um, queer people to have freedoms and rights in the city? <clears throat> Old people don't always remember too much. <laughs> totally fair. <laughs> this isn't a quiz. <laughs> Think about that for a little bit. Um, uh, let, let me pass for now. Okay. That's a nice one question. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, let me ask instead. Um, <clears throat> For you, what were some of the uh, most inspiring moments or the most challenging moments from being <coughs> such a visible <coughs> politician in such a difficult time in San Francisco's history? <laughs> yeah. I'm feeling really dumb right now, but I was, I remember about the 70s that I was very smart. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> in, the, in the 70s, it's... There was a thing about Harvey that was very boyish or very childish. Mm -hmm. Because it was like, you know, when a child finds a new rock and it's it's green and and, and there's a good thing. And and Harvey uh, what he felt was that when straight people look at at, at queers, they they couldn't see the green. Mm. They they thought we were just another lump of dirt, mm. uh, and that when you when you do see that, and I think this is what what, what Harvey did for individually for us and, his, and through the generations, not just the people, you know, is that you see the grain and and you uh, believe it's real, and 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 it we were it was, the seventies was a time of discovery. Mm -hmm. That you know that yeah, we weren't using the word queer that much even even back then, as I recall. But but we were we certainly were were avoiding a lot of the other words that were way of being say you're homosexual without saying you're homosexual. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a discovery of beauty, uh, and then of course with the AIDS epidemic. Uh, <coughs> So much beauty. Mm. So, much beauty. Mm -hmm. so uh, the AIDS epidemic for a person mm -hmm. my age in history, the AIDS epidemic was the experience. Mm -hmm. uh, there were so many others that, that were so important. But uh, dealing with mortality and community mm -hmm. uh, and vulnerability in that space from an increasing position of power. Mm -hmm. I had trouble keeping up sometimes. The younger ones were doing such great stuff. Mm. Mm. I'm not thinking about it. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, thank you. Just <coughs> thinking about Harvey and this call to ask all of us to come out of the closet. You mm -hmm. know, uh, back in those days, I, I was this baby growing up in the mission. Um, not surrounded by, you know, people that were supportive of what it was to be queer, you know, um, knowing that I needed to hide who I was from everybody. And here's a kid that has grown up in the center of, in the middle of San Francisco, mm -hmm. the most, the gayest place in the world. <laughs> I didn't even know, like, you know, we think about, like, this message of pointing to people away from us or in some other county or some other town, you know. Mm -hmm. I, here was this kid who like was scared shitless, didn't want to let anybody know who I really was, um, didn't have anybody to talk to, didn't even know where Castro was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I didn't know there was a Castro. Um, but you know the message that went national to make sure that we all like took a, that people took a stand and fought for for, for these issues really had long-term impact on, on, on communities and, and unfortunately um, we still need to do the work. Mm -hmm. um, 
Yeah. Those kids are still out there. Right. And and here. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And here. Right. Yeah. Well, so so politics is obviously a game. Uh, we're going to get a little bit into the dirt now, okay? Uh, politics is a game of winners and losers, right? And fights, right? And so um, the Alice Club and the Harry Milk Democratic Club and Magada, right? Um, log cabin. Uh, log, well, <laughs> which, 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 <laughs> they're in the orbit. Uh, sure. We did invite the Log Cabin Club folks here, right? And no, yeah, we did. I just want to acknowledge that, you know, that, I mean, this, the country is largely a two-party system. And, right. And here, we're a two-party system. We're, we're, we're on the end. <laughs> also, if you share with everyone what Magada stands for, I think many people know here, but not everybody. Okay, Magada, lesbians and gays of African descent. Is that right? For democratic action. For democratic action. That's right. It's a long name. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Yes. Right, thank you for saying that. So, so I want to sort of ask, um, right, uh, what have been some times that um, either you've been a part of or that you've um, heard through the uh, conversations that you have um, with others who've been a part of the, uh, the clubs? What have been particularly fraught or difficult times for the clubs? And what have been times when the clubs have worked really well together? <laughs> um, I, can, I can take that one. Yeah, sure. Uh, I actually started at the Harvey Milk Club. Because um, I, um, uh, like Kim, I didn't grow up in San Francisco, but I grew up in the Burbs, right around here. Um, and uh, not a very gay friendly area. Um, and I, um, but I, I had been doing campaigns since I was 13 years old, and so I moved to San Francisco right afterwards because that's what I wanted to do. And uh, became the membership chair at the Harvey Mill Club in 95 when Willie Brown was running against Roberta Actenberg. Mm -hmm. um, and there was, I think there were two endorsement <coughs> votes and uh, Roberta was blocked and it got really ugly really fast because it was a very, um, it, was, it was just a very heated mayor's race. Um, there weren't, it was old school, so there weren't runoff elections, so people didn't have to be nice to each other. There was the top two, and then there was the runoff. And those, for those people who um, won't get to enjoy those years, they were really, really, really fun. <laughs> really fun, bare knuckle, no, like, I don't have to be nice to so-and-so because I need their number two votes kind of stuff. Um, and um, a bunch of us left after Willie Brown got elected because... Um, it was very clear that the club, those were the days where you voted for the gay person because they were gay. Mm -hmm. That's like light now. I don't think it's as strong as it was um, <laughs> in those years. Um, and um, so that was a not happy time mm -hmm. in the gay community. And I, um, there were people that just didn't speak to each other for years afterwards, which um, I tried not to do that. It was, it, 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 it was rough. It was not fun. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that the lavender sweep effort um, was a time where the clubs could get along because we just agreed and again um, you know pro-district elections are not pro-district elections that's not the issue the issue was we wanted our voice at the table and we were going to agree on a certain number of candidates for school board for community college board for supervisor we were all we were going to just all pitch in we were going to left we were going to uh, live with lavender we were going to do everything we could to get them elected and we did really well yeah it was hugely um, successful what year was that 98. Yeah. 90. 90. 90. <coughs> it was one, I, I didn't get here until 93, 94, and I feel like it was one I'm happy, happy year. I had a happy year. Well, maybe it was a little bit sweet. I think Levin and Sweet was 90. So. That's okay. what I remember. Thank you for the connection. <laughs> <laughs> so there were two Levin and Sweet. Can you actually um, go into a little bit more definition of what Levin and Sweet is so mm -hmm. now? Um, so in the years where they, uh, where we didn't have district elections, there were five or six supervisors that were elected on every, was it every even year? I don't remember. Yeah. And then, um, and I, I, Tab, feel free to jump in. I, went, I, I wasn't there in 90 because I was off smoking pot and using senators. <laughs> so, um, um, so, you know, we agreed on whichever the candidates were and then they were labeled and then we did slate cards and we passed out stuff at ATT Castro and then we, you know, did all the, Door knocking and 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 door knock and door hanger hanging and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Does that help flesh it out? I meant I meant more of like the names of, of who because I, I think what the first wave was and Hazy the whole that gave Hazy but Actenberg 
Amiano mm -hmm. Migden. Mm -hmm. And I think that was the Yes, it was uh, it was uh, big ten and acting very for uh, supervisor and Amiano for school board, right. and we've That's also it. had a um, our first victory for domestic partners mm -hmm. because Prop S was defeated the, the previous year right That's after right. the earthquake. Yeah. But there was one year, I know there was a year when Susan Layout was on it, because that, that's the year that I remember. Right. So then, then that was either 94 or 96. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Unless the cast was on the community college board at that time. Mm -hmm. What, uh, for, the, for, uh, for the others of you, what were some of the times when the clubs worked particularly well together, or times when there were real uh, knockdown drag outs? I have my, my own personal favorite knockdown drag out. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to hear from the clubs first before I say mine. I have my own personal experience with, uh, you know, being a candidate uh, running last year mm -hmm. um, for District 11 supervisor. Mm -hmm. um, felt like I represented um, the Excelsior pretty well, working class, immigrant community. Um, trying to make sure that we had, we kept a, a queer voice on the Board of Supervisors mm -hmm. during a time where um, some of our electives were headed off to the state legislature, and I was able to get the um, Alice B. Tokla's PAC recommendation, uh, but uh, the following meeting, um, I guess some of the real estate folks came in and stripped me of, mm. of the recommendation, so mm -hmm. um, mm. I did lose that race by 400 votes. Mm. Oh. Mm -hmm. So. Um, that's kind of from a personal yeah. <laughs> oh. perspective. Yeah, yeah, no kidding. Yeah. I can talk about some of the in challenges that I have seen just sort of being a minority and somebody who has experienced some of the disparities that I now want to actively work to mm -hmm. um, be in a position to work with allies to resolve. Um, I had challenges in the, the two, um, two most recent electoral cycles. I had issues with uh, Prop Q. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was not in favor of taking away um, the only shelter that most people have. And now that we have a lot of people who are, like I said, bare, bare bones to the concrete, and that's a very scary situation um, because we just do not have enough shelter to provide for people. And I also had challenge um, challenges around, um, what was it, Prop J, when we were dealing with um, the decision to change how Airbnb worked. Mm -hmm. And at that time, yeah. I was, was it F? Sorry. Mm -hmm. the time flies and the letters yeah. just get <laughs> jumping in my head. But proposition <coughs> at that time, I was trying to Airbnb my apartment to save it from being taken away from mm -hmm. um, So, I mean, I have two degrees in technology, and I have been working for 20 years. I have been everywhere on the income scale from making 80, 90, to making nothing. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. so here comes along a proposition that sort of directly impacts me personally to the point where it's going to make me a lawbreaker mm -hmm. because I'm having to Airbnb my apartment out for, you know, two, three weeks more than the law that, that we're, people are advocating for. Um, so I'm just like, this is actually coming from my throat. Mm -hmm. My ability to try to use this network this this resource that I'm not trying to use it to you know give away my apartment permanently or take away housing stock I'm using it in I guess the most appropriate way and now a lot of people um, are using those sort of sharing resources to save their butt mm -hmm. and um, and that was just really challenging to like sit there be a political person somebody who has to really make a, a fast and hard decision on whether I'm supporting it personally and whether I'm going to go out into the community and advocate mm -hmm. for it. And while I believe in some of the merits of some of these laws and how it was written, just there were aspects of it where I'm like, I actually can't go for this. Mm -hmm. I can't go for it and I might be in a position to take advantage of the law that might become, or I'm going to be negatively impacted. And even so sometimes it's also, <coughs> you really are standing on that edge mm -hmm. where you may want to say one thing, but you're saying something else, and it really does um, impact all of us like, on a very mm. personal level when you have to make that decision where you're advocating um, against yourself sometimes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it's really hard to like, oh, okay, I'm cutting my own neck off here mm. by saying one thing and um, 
needing to do another, not even mm -hmm. that I believe something else, is that I may need to do something else. Yeah. Um, and I have those couple uh, challenges and been learning ways to deal with that, but I've also been learning ways to um, engage the community um, in having really serious conversations with um, people on the streets, as I do often, and having conversations with elected officials, and having conversations with all our democratic clubs. Mm -hmm. and, um, I try to go to, especially when it's electoral cycle, and I get kind of tired of it, instead of one PAC meeting, I go to about 10. Mm. And not only do I go to 10 different PAC meetings, I go to specific ones because I know that my experience as a minority mm -hmm. um, carries weight. My mm -hmm. experience as a minority that has gone through significant issues mm -hmm. in the city carries weight when I'm able to talk about policy from a perspective that's not being heard in, mm -hmm. in category. So um, in Alice, I was able to kind of use my experiences. I know what homelessness looks like, and I know that I'm not for taking away tents. So in that organization, we ended up going no endorsement. Mm -hmm. That's probably mm -hmm. because I spoke adamantly against that. I didn't believe that that was um, a good direction for a city like San Francisco to go, to go into because we just do not have shelters. And we had a whole bunch of shelters lying around and space for people. Mm -hmm. And I might, have been a bit, I might have been on the other side of that, mm -hmm. but we're just not there yet. And mm -hmm. I don't think we're going to be there for probably another five years. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. that's that's my take on when you're dealing with the challenging um, decision to make and as somebody who's working in policy or somebody who's trying to get the community to support um, either myself or an initiative based off of what emphasis I put behind it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I want to say something real quick because I wasn't yeah. going to say this. So okay. I, I may come to my senses and we <laughs> get Say it. <laughs> uh, my other political work, besides being queer stuff, has been in the socialist movement. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was the national vice chair of the Democratic Socialist America, and that was fun. Mm -hmm. That was fun. That was the cool case. <laughs> and uh, I, and as I look back over my life, I wish I had put more emphasis into that into mm. that work. And I'm, I'm wondering now if uh, I'm standing back because I'm not really involved with it now. Whether being a democratic club. Mm -hmm. You know, we've always said we're a democratic club, but, and I'm liking the but more and more and more. <laughs> because it, it seems to me that there are, you know, radical positions that are getting a lot of attention these yes. days. Yes, yes. Uh, that, that when we talk about who's going to be the vice president of the Democratic Party, this has become one. Mm -hmm. And that may be one way that that the milk club could be a really good democratic club would be mm -hmm. to stop being a democratic club. Mm -hmm. uh, or be a new kind of democratic club that is specifically promoted to re rejection of the status quo mm -hmm. and a lot of the craft that goes back to Woodrow you know, Wilson and there, yeah. and begin to support more radical structures and creations and possibilities mm -hmm. uh, in the political world, but mm -hmm. I can't say that, of course. No, <laughs> no you can't, but I think it's something that I, I, I think it's something that this, it's part of this moment, right? And what's so remarkable about uh, queer and LGBT political activism inside and outside of our clubs is that there's always been that radical voice and sensibility pushing for something more, right? Um, but San Francisco is such a machine politics town in some ways that um, by the time those radical ideas make their way through the machine, right, um, it's hard to kind of see um, what comes out, the, if, if what comes out the other side is actually, right, still has that radical, right, vision of potentiality. So, I, so maybe a, a, a I really want to say my thing that was like the, the fight that I was like, that was the most bruising uh, that I was a little bit of a part of. Uh, but then I'll move on because I'm, I'm the moderator. But I think that the, the Migden Leno mm -hmm. oh, fight yeah. was huge, right? And really mm -hmm. bruising, right? On all sides. Um, and that there were like ways in which I think there were, um, there were costs and injuries from that that, that lasted for a really long time, right? Um, 
But let's go to this radical idea more because I think it's more interesting. Um, uh, so what are, let's, we don't even need to call them radical, but what are some ways in which um, our queer pasts might inform or sensibilities might inform ways of looking forward to the future that don't accept <laughs> Uh, political and economic systems of the status quo as the thing that's going to take us there, right? Are there other vehicles, either from the past or from this political moment, that you think that we should be investing more of our energy and time in? Um, yeah. I think that we are in a very interesting time right now um, in what's happening in our country and what's happening here in San Francisco and the conversations that come across my ear, um, that a lot of what's to come in the future really will have a minority um, at the forefront. Right. In or maybe of color at the forefront because yeah. literally, right, yeah. not, maybe not be minority. Yeah. Right. I mean, a well, minority can cover anything. I mean, there's right. a number of minorities sitting at this table, there's a number of minorities sitting in this room, but when it comes to politics, uh, those sort of dynamics change. And mm -hmm. we do have some representation um, in all of our elected and appointed seats, it just never seems like enough. Mm -hmm. um, and when we look at the ex life experiences of the people who occupy positions of power, and we contrast them to the people who um, don't come from positions of power, and, and looking at that sort of power dynamic and struggle, um, those are the things that I consider when I'm choosing people to support or, mm -hmm. or and things of that nature. Is like, have you, from a <coughs> have you gone through some really gritty stuff? Mm -hmm. um, and if you've gone through some really gritty stuff and you're coming to um, fight against that, then from my perspective, I'm not going to give um, that type of person my support versus somebody who just has not gone through some great things and they might still be fighting for. Um, things that we all hold as common values, but I'm going to go for the person who's gone through it because I believe that their perspective on the situation or a piece of legislation, um, that type of voice in, in, in the arena um, really helps to address situations that might not be addressed otherwise. Mm -hmm. I can give myself as an example and the things that I've been touching recently, just being a part of uh, the GOPT history, um, and then also being a part of the heritage work that we're doing now, just mm -hmm. sitting in that meeting room and offering my thoughts and opinions. Um, I just, there was only one other black person in that room, mm -hmm. and, and it's just like I got three or four comments. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for offering your input and, and sort of the guidance on the type of things that we should be doing as a city to address capturing that history. So imagine I don't exist. <laughs> and now imagine um, I don't exist and you know nobody was could have been in that same position like myself to offer those inputs and opinions. Yeah. So that's that's what I'm saying by having different sort of um, experience at the table and having an experience that comes from um, <coughs> positions that aren't always brought into the spotlight or mm -hmm. given an opportunity to um, to advocate for their own um, community's experiences. Like I advocate not just for being a black gay person, I advocate for the city as a whole, but I also advocate for other minority experiences. Like everybody will look at me and think I'm just a black person, but I'm black, I'm Native American, I'm Haitian American. And I have Muslim heritage, my mm -hmm. name is Hassan. And, you know, they really did stop me at the border coming back from um, Mexico to the United States, and I almost didn't get back into mm -hmm. my own country. Mm -hmm. um, and so, those are the type of experiences mm -hmm. that I'd love to see in our future leadership to help us come to um, some real good same page understandings about our future together. Yeah, I appreciate the so, sort of experience and. and um um, sort of who's who's sitting around the table fundamentally alters the conversations that are happening around the table. Yeah, I was going to say, it, it, I think that's really important. It's sort of like, um, I don't know. I think often in politics, it seems like um, our identities are sort of put at the forefront, but like what that, our relationship with that identity is really sort of ignored too often. Mm -hmm. um, I grew up in the Omaha area. Um, my mom had me when she was in high school. Um, I remember my mom getting food stamps. Um, I remember uh, her, you know, being very upset about money. And 
I also remember, you know, when I got a little bit older, um, I was relatively economically privileged. Uh, my parents bought me a car, and I got to have sort of whatever I wanted in a place where middle class people can actually like thrive and own a home. And um, <clears throat> but when I <coughs> tried to move on to you know, go to grad school and do more. And when I was doing activism and I came out, like I completely lost all financial, um, you know, support. Mm -hmm. And so this interesting thing mm -hmm. that I sort of experienced was that, that really was so painful was that um, when I was in a room with people of color in Omaha uh, doing queer related stuff, um, I was this like young gay man and People generally listen to almost anything I said. Mm -hmm. you know, but I, if I was studying something and I, you know, sort of presented the same information someone else said, like there we would do some sort of action about it. But if someone else said they had this concern about it, nothing necessarily mm -hmm. happened. Mm -hmm. um, and in talking to a lot of my sort of more moderate friends, who, and that's it. I'm not trying to insult. Any, any sense of moderate anything, probably moderate on some issues, but it, what, what I, I, I often forget is actually one of my greatest privileges is probably my experiences of really, really being at, at points where I was literally just eating rice and almost starving so that I could afford to go to grad school uh, mm -hmm. interviews. Um, and, and in those moments when I wasn't allowing anyone to know that because if people knew that I was poor and struggling, they they might their attention, the forefront of their attention was like about whether or not I was alright. And I didn't care about that because we were fighting to integrate like a support group and we were fighting to actually make our support groups, you know, have a, a positive impact on people's mental health. And we did and, and, and we got a lot of that done. But had I been someone else I don't know if they would have listened to me. And had I not had those experiences of sort of being um, in these places where I felt like I couldn't tell anyone what I was going through, um, had, I, had I told those people, I don't know if those things would have happened. Mm -hmm. um, so this, this, this thing I think that happens here that I think is just so strange is when I moved to San Francisco, it's like, it's, you know, people of all different backgrounds are not actually necessarily represented in elected office. Mm -hmm. Because if you're a gay white man in San Francisco, that's sort of privileging you right now. Mm -hmm. um, and it's sort of maintaining the status quo. I don't know what comes from that experience mm -hmm. um, inherently that makes you have anything that will push anything forward. Mm -hmm. I, I really think that it's those un, like really connecting and understanding that things can get better and mm -hmm. finding those solutions that often comes from really, really difficult times. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Yeah. Do other people have thoughts about um, uh, ideas or um, <clears throat> directions that will take us out of sort of the, the status quo of, um, of uh, where we've uh, been in terms of uh, political solutions? Um, that people are excited about for the future? <laughs> well, I think it's, from my perspective, it's pretty obvious that the Democratic Party has, a lot of people feel like the Democratic Party has failed them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as a person of color, someone who's worked on immigrant rights for a very long time, you know, mm -hmm. I can't separate my queerness from who I am as a person of color. Um, I think it's a really exciting time. Mm -hmm. I think the fact that I'm co-chair with another Latina immigrant for, for the Harvard Milk Club, you, you know, you think we've come a long way, but in some ways we haven't. You know, mm -hmm. the last person of color to be president of the Harvey Milk Club was in the 90s. Right. <laughs> um, and the only other person I think is Gwen Clay. Um, mm -hmm. So we continue to make strides even within the context of what we consider progressive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so. Um, there's a, a lot of work that needs to be done. I think that we can learn many, many lessons from social movements, mm -hmm. uh, from you know the, the queer fight within those social movements. Um, I would say that for me, having worked under Tom Momiano's mentorship, I, I learned a lot from him. I, 
you know, I learned that like as a policymaker or a change maker, you have to think long term. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Here we are, for full circle, you know, and we might be in the same situation that we were ten years in terms of queer rights, you know, under attack with the Trump administration. Mm -hmm. um, and so, what we're going to have to do is. Um, come together, build solidarity with people that um, we haven't usually built solidarity with. Yeah. Um, and I think um, think of policy, think of change from a long-term perspective. You know, you might engage in a fight now. You might have to be militant. Back to what you were talking about, act up days. Mm -hmm. You know, we need that militancy back in our movements. We need to not be afraid. And what was the saying? Silence equals death. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for us, silence does equals death. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and mm -hmm. so we're gonna have to like reclaim those histories again and uh, think outside the box. Mm -hmm. I guess for me, um, just listening to everybody, um, I would hope that everyone that came here tonight came, well, because the election put everybody, threw everyone out, basically, right? And um, there isn't a person that wasn't depressed for <laughs> a long time afterwards. Um, but there's a long, there's a, there's a, there's a huge, there, what I would like everyone to walk out with is there is a place for me to be active in what the country is going to be. Mm -hmm. um, there are those of us that want to work within the party as it has been exasperating and frustrating and <coughs> the tunnel and there's no light because we do not see, there was no Barack Obama from the convention where we were like, that's the guy that I want, to, that's the guy I want to bet on or the woman, whoever it is. Um, the party obviously uh, it is split, um, and like I said, there's no leader, so we have all that going on, but when we see the light and when we get there, it's going to be very sweet. Mm. Um, I also think what Harry is saying in terms of acting outside of the structure mm -hmm. is going to make sure that the party doesn't leave people to the side again. Whether that's the um, uh, the Wisconsinites, the uh, uh, you know the middle of the middle of the country, everything that's not <clears throat> a coastal city, I, people understand what I'm saying, but also just you know making sure from a policy perspective that we are not forgetting people from different economic classes, people <coughs> from different countries, people that made this made this country what it is, mm -hmm. um, and so you know. Again, it's like there's room for all of us to be active. Mm -hmm. And the other part of um, silence equals death is action equals life. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's not going to be pretty. Mm -hmm. It just isn't. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we, I, I wouldn't say that we have ourselves to blame, but there's a large, we all have, um, we can all put, we can all get our hands dirty.